chapter six of the lonely lady of grosvenor square this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by ruhi huck the lonely lady of grosvenor square by henry de la pasture chapter six the nurseries if glory leads the way you'll be madly rushing on never thinking if they kill you that my happiness is gone god has been very good to me wrote louis from durban in the first letter jean received from him concerning the somaliland campaign why should this good luck come to me when every fellow out here would give anything to go we ought to reach obia in about ten days the general impression here seems to be that it will be only a preliminary campaign to make ready for larger operations next cold weather it won't delay my return home for very long so make the best of it my darling little genie my best chum is so disgusted with what he calls my everlasting luck that he won't speak to me it's all the harder for him poor old fellow because he applied and i didn't not dreaming i should have the ghost of a chance i walked into a photographer and had my old fizz done to please you that is so like louis to try to make it up to me some other way thought jean and there is another thing i hate writing about but i must and you would rather i did so here goes in case anything happens to me write at once to my bankers they have my will and life assurance policy i forget if i told you i managed to insure my life when i first joined it is for one thousand pounds which will easily clear my debts buy a good horse for uncle roberts and leave something over for you also they have a letter for you which i wrote a long time ago but i hope that you may never have to apply for the same my genie dear but that i shall soon be home and throw it into the fire and laugh over it and tell you the contents by word of mouth the only thing i feel guilty towards you is in starting for somaliland when i was due and had promised to come home these are the occasions when you wish i was not a soldier no never said jean but they are the only occasions on which a soldier has a chance of showing what he is worth if indeed he is worth anything and anyway i shall be two thousand miles nearer to you jean received this letter in the middle of january and she perceived by the date that it was written some time before the news of his inheritance had reached louis it roused her from her depression and awoke renewed pride in her brother's success where others had failed you see they always pick him out it just shows what they must think of him she said to dunham with melancholy exultation it does indeed ma'am but if i was him i must say i should have stood firm and refused to go with all this business waiting to be settled and mr valentine able to do next to nothing till he comes home he did not know all that when he wrote besides it would be dishonour to refuse to go on active service said jean with reddening cheeks how can you think it possible mrs dunham well ma'am a gentleman with his fortune has something better to do than go prancing over the desert looking for naked savages in my opinion said dunham firmly let others go as has their bread to earn and don't care how they does it but for a gentleman who will have thousands a year to spend as he likes i calls it tempting providence i'm afraid it is said simple jean but you don't understand louis is a soldier it is in his blood he must go while there is any fighting left to be done it would break his heart to stay behind though i am sure it breaks mine that he should run more risks but he is always lucky somehow it gives me confidence to remember how he went through all those dreadful battles in south africa and never was touched and he says this will be only a short expedition people used to say that about south africa ma'am well i remember hewitt telling us it would all be over in three months said dunham gloomily but he was wrong as he nearly always is though never owning it still perhaps as my brother says he will probably not be long i might get his room ready all the same it is his right 
to have the best room in the house he's the master now said dunham but her voice trembled oh mrs dunham you do not think i would take auntie caroline's room said jean sincerely shocked why not mm, she won't never want it no more tis my belief she'd have wished it though now that velvet pile carpet will stand cigarette ash i can't tell i remember his poor father used to drop it about long ago did he indeed but louis does not smoke that's not likely by this time ma'am whatever he may have done when he left home said dunham in a pitying voice as though she thought cigarette smoking must be hereditary no i assure you he is not a smoker he would have told me if he had become one gentlemen don't tell their sisters everything ma'am if you'll excuse me said dunham jean gave up the attempt to convince the old woman that louise was the brilliant exception who proved this rule but about the room she remained firm louise must not take aunt caroline's room he would not like it at all he was not used to a large room and would think it too luxurious for a soldier then if pike and me is to have the best bedroom floor all to ourselves said dunham severely which i can't think becoming in but far be it from me to say so then there's nothing left but the nurseries what have never been used since we came here jean mounted the echoing stone staircase almost eagerly to explore the upper floor in company with her conductress the stairs are very steep she said pausing before the little white gate at the top in order to allow mrs dunham to recover breath i suppose long ago when the house was built they put this gate here to prevent the children falling down the stairs they put it up too late by all accounts miss jane said dunham this house belonged to poor miss marney's cousin the late duke of monaghan she bought it from him over twenty years ago and they put up the gate after the little heir fell down this flight of stairs and was carried into her grace's room for dead was he killed said jean horrified crippled for life ma'am they sold the house in consequence they say her grace vowed she would never set foot in it again she never came near your poor auntie but the duke called on her twice before he died said dunham rather proudly and by all accounts she lost very little by not seeing the duchess for no one has a good word for her they say she led the poor duke a terrible life with her temper and all jean looked pitifully at the scene of this long past catastrophe she pictured the little heir running gaily forth from his nursery for the last time the fall the cry the silence and the horrified nurse lifting a little crushed figure this part of the house has not been touched ma'am since miss marney came here it had all been done up fresh when the poor duke succeeded only a year or two before the accident miss marney had no use for this floor so she left it alone and only decorated the rooms she occupied she never came up here the stairs being so steep and her heart weak there's two very nice-sized bedrooms ma'am beyond this said dunham jean walked through the empty and silent nursery softly and on tiptoe they seemed haunted by the ghosts of the children who had played there and who must have climbed on to chairs and tables when they wanted to look out of the high barred windows the walls were still covered with a faded paper of pictured nursery rhymes we will leave these rooms just as they are she said but oh mrs dunham if you think i might i would so much rather come upstairs to one of these large empty bedrooms and have the one next to mine made ready for him it would seem almost like company to know he was coming and besides i think surely the maids must be sleeping on this floor just beyond the bay's door i am very often frightened at night mrs dunham all alone among the empty drawing-rooms if you won't think it foolish of me to say so and i hear such odd noises i sometimes feel as though the mahogany wardrobe must be walking about it creaks so dreadfully why didn't you say so before ma'am said dunham astonished tis for you to give the orders your things shall be moved this very day and the head housemaid shall sleep in a little room close by within call as ought to be mine only my poor lady would have me next door to her to be sure i might have thought you would be nervous oh thank you mrs dunham said the poor little lonely lady gratefully for she was indeed unable to realize that it was she after all and not dunham who was mistress of the house 
her conscience pricked her nevertheless for the opportunities she made to ask dunham's advice or exchange a word or two with her what would aunt caroline think of me she reflected in dismay now and then she said one must never talk to the servants that is what it is to be what poor old granny morgan used to say louise and i were neither fish flesh nor fowl nor good red herring at home i wickedly look down on uncle roberts and think myself more refined than he and that a farmhouse is no place for a de corset when i am here it is the farm which seems the most natural and i feel like a doll stuck up and doing nothing quite out of place and would be glad if the youngest housemaid the pretty one with red hair might come and talk to me she looks far more cheerful than mrs dunham surely aunt caroline would not have called mrs dunham exactly a servant after they had lived so many years together she must have earned the right to be more of a friend and if i talked to nobody i believe it would end in my going mad i used to enjoy my meals but now i would almost rather go without them than be waited on in solemn silence by hewitt and william a worse penance than those solitary repasts was the daily drive which dunham hinted that it behooved a lady however lonely to indulge jean dared not refuse for she was penetrated by an honest anxiety to carry out the wishes of her late aunt and to prove herself a worthy representative of the family she learned from dunham the daily routine of miss barney's life in london during the past twenty years and endeavoured as faithfully as possible to pursue the same programme but she was buoyed up by a secret hope that when louise came home he would discover a less irksome regime to be equally suitable to her exalted position thus she walked with dunham every morning at noon down upper grosvenor street and into the park that the toy rockshire terrier might be carefully exercised in a leading string and back again through upper brook street and so home jean might have enjoyed these expeditions had the weather been less cold and had dunham and the dog been able to walk a little faster but the mincing steps of the aged maid were carefully timed to accord with the slow waddle of the obese lapdog dunham gathering her rustling silk skirts in a bunch before her held them up to display her old-fashioned elastic-sided boots and picked her way nervously over the crossings of which she had never been able to lose her rustic dread whilst jean in a little black cloth jacket suited rather to the warm west country and to her accustomed energetic tramping over hill and dale than to the london east winds shivered and dawdled by her side but it occurred neither to her nor to dunham to take miss marney's sables and sealskins out of their camphorated wrappings and make use of them they were preserved and tended as jealously as though dunham expected their late owner to return at any moment and demand them at her hands the drive was always taken in the immense double brougham for it was miss marney's rule to have the close carriage out in winter and the open carriage in summer and buckham the coachman had no notion of making changes at this time of life he was so ponderous and infirm that he had to be assisted on to the box but once safely seated there he drove carefully and well william the irish footman sat beside him and they apparently decided together where the drive should be taken and how long it should last william's unfortunate low comedy face and his involuntary but perpetual smile as he daily touched his hat and waited for orders at the carriage door caused the lonely lady quite unjustly to suspect him of laughing at her in his sleeve and the very suspicion doubled her nervousness every afternoon she stammered please go nowhere in particular just drive about and every afternoon having thus uttered she beat her brains for a more dignified and sensible reply one day it occurred to her to inquire of dunham why a stout red volume of addresses was always carefully handed into the carriage with the rug it's the red book ma'am said dunham rather shocked at this new display of ignorance i see it is a red book said jean meekly but why must i take it out driving why though your poor auntie had given up paying visits for some time before she died yet in case she had felt inclined to do so of course she wanted the red book handy to look up where the people lived i see said jean but she understood nothing 
there used to be a lot of cards left here when we first came said dunham nodding sadly towards the bowl of hoarded dingy pasteboards which decorated the table in the hall did aunt caroline know so many people when first she came to london she knew very few people but she paid a lot of calls on people whom you might have thought would be glad enough to know her seeing she was related by blood though rather distant to be sure to a many of them she tried to distract herself after her poor brother's death by making new acquaintances poor dear which she never could have done in his lifetime for he couldn't abide visitors though to be sure he grudged her nothing else and she always had her clothes from elise and worth in all the grand places though it often seemed a pity like with no one to see them but she liked to keep up a proper dignity miss jane as a lady in her position ought yes said jean and her heart sank but there all her efforts came to nothing she was too old-fashioned to take the new faces or new ways and londoners was too free and easy for her as had been all her life miss marney of orset and accustomed to take the lead and be deferred to she just quarrelled with one after the other and that's about all it came to and nobody comes to look for you in london miss jane be who you may that is very true and jean sighed in sympathy you can be more solitary here than ever you could in the depths of the country said dunham shaking her head whereat the least the passers-by will give you good day so for the last ten or fifteen years we've been satisfied to keep ourselves to ourselves willy-nilly as a body might say but it's different with you missy you're young and have your life before you it's not for me to advise you ma'am but i would make friends while i was young in your place and not leave it till it's too late miss jane that is just what my aunt said to me that i should have plenty of visits to make later on thought jean and she recalled her aunt's injunctions to be exclusive i must be very careful whom i make friends with however she thought anxiously it seemed to her that all london lay open to her choice and the only question was where to begin it would have been hard to fathom the depths of jean's social ignorance she consulted dunham no further but thought out the question of calls and callers for herself in the light of the foregoing hints and of her lively recollections of the visiting code of the rector's wife at coeditel she said she never lost a moment calling on new neighbours thought jean she said it was the duty of the residents i wonder why nobody has called on me perhaps they think it's too soon after poor aunt caroline's death or perhaps they do not realise that any one is living here and think i'm just the companion or somebody of that kind waiting till the owner comes home but i am the lady of the house really i suppose it is my duty as dunham says to make a few friends but it is very hard to know where to begin she turned over the pages of the red book helplessly the day after the first sunday they came to church she always went said jean i remember that because i asked her once why she waited till then as one was not to lose a moment in welcoming them and she said only to give them time to settle down well i suppose it must be the people living in the same square who are my neighbours anyway they are the nearest the first time i see an arrival of a new family here put in the paper i will make a start she resolved she scanned the advertisements in the fashionable column of the morning post very regularly for some days after making this resolution and her scrutiny was presently rewarded by the announcement that mr and the honourable mrs weller had arrived at one twenty nine grosvenor square this was on a friday jean considerably allowed the proper interval to elapse and on monday afternoon when starting for a drive she delivered an order to the astonished william which he had to repeat twice to buckham on the box before the coachman could believe his ears please drive me to one twenty nine grosvenor square i am going to pay a visit said the lonely lady in a determined but shaking voice End of chapter six chapter seven of the lonely lady of grosvenor square this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by ruhi huck the lonely lady of grosvenor square by mrs henry de la pasture chapter seven the call <laughs> 
mrs weller had entertained a small party of friends at an early luncheon but when the clock struck half-past three she began to hope that they would not linger unduly over their coffee and cigarettes in the drawing-room as they seemed much inclined to do lest her programme for the afternoon be disarranged the butler who was entirely in his employer's confidence on such matters was also growing uneasy he knew that mrs weller had an important engagement at the other end of town and he did not see how she would be able to keep it and be home again in time for her bridge party at half-past four unless some sort of a move were made but then neither did he see how he could hurry the duchess away he had already announced her grace's carriage in a confidential whisper not to interrupt more than was necessary her grace's animated conversation with mr weller and the duchess said thank you and went on talking to her host as though nothing had happened of the other ladies one was intending to walk and being the least important of the three did not like to make the first move and the other having no horses to consider but a motor which conveyed her so quickly from one spot to another that she had some ado to fill up her afternoon in proportion was not sorry to dawdle over her cigarette a little longer than usual the butler being an adept at reading his lady's most expressionless face decided as a desperate remedy to admit callers though mrs weller was never at home to anybody except by appointment save one or two intimates whose names were specially registered in the butler's brain thus it came about that jean was presently ushered into the presence of eight ladies and gentlemen seated round the spacious room and into the midst of a buzz of conversation with the loud announcement of her name brought to a sudden though a momentary pause for the space of a single second eight pairs of eyes glanced curiously towards the smiling dimpling blushing countenance of the timid visitor jean was abashed almost to faintness yet the room and its occupants were instantly impressed upon her consciousness even as she paused hesitating upon the threshold a stately room with red walls dark pictures a quantity of gilding many mirrors and a polished slippery floor one old bald-headed gentleman two tall middle-aged gentlemen and one young rather small fair gentleman a stout short commanding-looking lady with a curled grey front and a red face talking in a very loud voice to the bald gentleman and holding long-handled glasses to her short-sighted eyes this was the duchess a thin lady in rough tweed with a tartan blouse and an air of great distinction this was the lady who did not feel important enough to get up and go away though she and mrs weller and the butler all wished that the party might come to an end an exquisite languid lady in flowing draperies and a gainsborough headpiece who was the owner of the motor brougham and a lady to whom the only epithet that could be applied was the word smart and this was mrs weller though it did not occur to jean as a possibility that the lady of the house even at an early and informal luncheon could be wearing a hat in her own drawing-room mrs weller was smart and she was nothing else in particular neither kind nor cross in temper neither warm nor icy in disposition neither interested nor bored by life in general even her appearance was of the negative order though it varied considerably with the changes of fashion when waists were worn high she was short-waisted when low her body grew miraculously longer her abundant hair had been fair until straw-coloured hair became too expensive when it blushed a modest titan red which was darkened by easy stages into brown presently as she grew older a few silver threads would certainly appear for mrs weller had a strong sense of the fitness of things and nothing would have induced her to allow her hair to turn white in a single night though when the time came a coiffure a la marie antoinette with dark eyebrows and lashes to form an agreeable contrast would probably not be wanting yet she contrived to avoid all unpleasant obviousness of the artificial presenting only so to speak her picturesqueness to the public and keeping her methods modestly in the background as becomes a true artist 
from habit mrs weller never made an engagement without writing it down so she kept her memory clear for facts concerning that portion of humanity in which she was chiefly interested her mind was stored with their names their relationships recognized or unrecognized their doings and their undoings and the approximate value of their social or financial status racing and card playing received a large share of her conscious attention entertaining visiting slumming and theatre going had become almost mechanical processes without referring to her engagement book she could hardly have told what she had been doing on the previous day her mind deprived of sufficient repose learned to rest though her body was in action and remained blank very often whilst her person was being rushed from one function to another whilst her lips were smiling and her well-trained tongue uttering short platitudes it required something out of the ordinary to arrest her real attention jean's appearance was something out of the ordinary and for a moment mrs weller's mechanism of politeness ceased to work in consequence then recovering her presence of mind and recognizing the butler's strategy at one at the same moment she advanced to meet her unknown visitor who was so obviously unable to distinguish her hostess that general conversation was immediately and politely resumed to give her an opportunity of explaining herself nevertheless the butler had triumphed for the admittance of an afternoon caller produced the anticipated effect good gracious said the duchess looking across the room at the empire clock and not perceiving that the hands were pointing to twenty minutes past twelve i had no idea it was so late i must fly now you will promise to consider what i have been saying mr weller it is persons like yourself to whom we look in this matter practical business-like men mr weller who was on the stock exchange and who desired rather to be considered fashionable than business-like gave a somewhat sickly smile and declared himself already convinced by the arguments of the duchess the more warmly because she gave some evidence of a desire to repeat them all over again from the beginning whilst he was engaged in combating this inclination by recapitulating them himself as rapidly as possible mrs weller shook hands with jean and said how do you do in an uncertain puzzled voice it was then that jean found courage to utter the remark which she had rehearsed to herself at intervals ever since the announcement of the weller's arrival in town had appeared in the morning post i am very glad to see you mrs weller and i hope you are feeling a little more settled by this time mrs weller the heartfelt kindness of her tone and careful repetition of mrs weller's name were due to jean's determination to follow her model as closely as possible she reproduced the rector's wife with great exactness but mrs weller's astonishment at this address was so painfully obvious that jean was obliged to descend into a stammering explanation in her own person i live at ninety nine over the way said jean the house belonged to my aunt miss marney of orset and she is dead and i am living there all alone till my brother comes home i i saw in the papers that you had only just arrived so being such a near neighbour i i thought i would come and see you oh indeed said mrs weller speechless the brown eyes grew larger and the red cheeks turned white i am afraid i must have done something wrong or unusual after all said jean mrs weller's vacant expression offered so little consolation that she looked round almost wildly as though for a means of escape from the situation into which her ignorance had betrayed her her glance fell upon the face of the young gentleman whose conversation with mrs weller her entrance had interrupted he was so close that he must have heard the greetings which had been exchanged between his hostess and her uninvited guest and jean thought he looked rather sorry for her her brown eyes conveyed to him the unconscious appeal for help the young man responded instantly to that mute almost despairing look and flung himself gallantly into the breach ninety-nine was my father's old house he said in a very gentle and courteous tones will you introduce me to miss chum 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 with a polite mumble to cover his ignorance of jean's name the duke of monaghan said mrs wheeler's mechanical tongue before she remembered that she did not know in the least to whom she was presenting her visitor oh said jean she forgot her embarrassment in her surprise and delight are you really the little boy who fell down the nursery staircase i am indeed said the duke 
his blue eyes regarded her with an expression in which mirth and melancholy held equal shares but i was told you were crippled for life she said ingeniously not quite as bad as that he turned the conversation dexterously did i not hear you say that miss marney of orset was your aunt my great-aunt my father had the honour of claiming cousinship with her said the duke politely yes she told me she bought the house from him but then we are we must be related too said jeanne and her face returning to its natural colour looked quite happy and animated again i hope so said the duke with a little bow which he thought rather charming but very old-fashioned in a boy of his years louis never bowed like that here there was a general movement among the company and every one advanced to take leave of mrs weller who was listening petrified to this conversation the duke springing from his seat as his hostess rose moved a pace or two forward and jeanne saw that he was lame poor little heir jeanne conscious of her own rustic strength and ruddy health felt very sorry for the duke he was still rather little scarcely taller than herself slight and fair and absurdly delicate looking she thought for a man jeanne had but one standard for manhood in her heart and the duke fell grievously short of it louise at twenty years old when she had seen him last in the very flower and perfection of his youth had measured six foot one in his stockings she thought of his broad chest his lithe slender form and active springing gait his strong muscular brown hands and sunburnt face poor sickly duke so little and weak and lame and colouring like a girl with a mere effort of speaking to a stranger jeanne forgot her own shyness in the warm pity which filled her heart good-bye dear i had such a delightful conversation with your dear good man i could hardly tear myself away i have been boring him quite too dreadfully said the duchess meaning to be playful and unaware that she was emphasizing an unhappy truth denise i am going to walk mother said the duke the duchess looked vexed with another gallant effort causing yet a fresh variation from pallor to redness of his unfortunately tell-tale complexion the young man boldly presented jean to his parent explaining the connection very clearly and briefly as he did so a new cousin dear me how charming said the duchess looking rather disapprovingly at jean through her glasses do come and see me i never understand relationships it is quite hopeless you know for a stupid person like myself i am generally in after five well if you won't come denise i must go alone she turned once more to her hostess good-bye dear it has been too nice seeing you again don't forget wednesday at four and i shall depend on you for all the prettiest things on our stall mrs weller assured her that she would not forget mr weller escorted her grace downstairs and the rest of the party gradually melted away the duke in his turn shook hands and jean watched him limping across the great room with much concern lest he should slip and fall upon the polished floor she came to herself with a start observing that mrs weller was obviously waiting for her too to take leave and depart though she did not speak until the door had closed behind the duke i am afraid i must ask you to excuse me pray don't think me rude but i have an engagement she said with more civility than she would have shown perhaps had the duke not been so good-natured as to claim cousinship with his rather shabby stranger but still without any kindness in her voice jeanne was too obviously a nobody too rustic in appearance and manner to make her a possible acquaintance for mrs weller let her be related to whom she would mrs weller knew the duchess of monaghan well and was acquainted with all her ways she had a loud and hearty manner and was always as gracious to nobodies as only really great ladies can afford to be and she always asked them to go and see her after five and then forgot all about them they generally went and then they heard that the duchess was not at home and derived what satisfaction they might from leaving their humble cards and there was an end of it if she had really wished to seek the further acquaintance of her new cousin she would have asked her to lunch thought the experienced mrs weller so she was civil but not impressive when she begged jean to excuse her oh 
i will go at once mrs weller cried jean she was distressed but there were no servants present to make her nervous and in her eyes mrs weller was a woman almost old enough to be her mother who would surely now that they were alone be too kind to be angry when she knew that her visitor had only trespassed through ignorance and was sincerely penitent please forgive me mrs weller said poor rustic jean who had no idea how this constant repetition of her name jarred upon the well-trained instincts of her hostess who was as full of conventional good breeding as she was empty of emotions in the country where i was brought up our rector's wife used to call upon neighbours directly they arrived and i thought it was the same in london i am afraid it is all wrong and i have done something dreadful i saw it in all your faces somehow as i came in and i could have sunk through the floor mrs weller but i am lonely at home and hoped i was going the right way to make a few friends by being neighbourly and paying calls she looked anxiously into the impassive face what odd fishy eyes had mrs weller thought poor jean they looked through you and at the wall beyond as though you were transparent or not there at all it would be very kind of you to explain why it was wrong mrs weller she faltered and she realized that with every word she had spoken mrs weller had grown less interested though her vague civility of tone and manner never faltered i am afraid i have really no time for explanations she was walking to the fireplace of course i quite understand it was a mistake her hand on the bell pray think no more of it she rang twice would you like a cab sent for oh do you have a carriage she looked at the servant who entered and this time her expressionless countenance spoke and dumbly directed him to show the unwelcome guest out as speedily as might be jean found herself walking down the grand staircase wrapped as it were in a cloud of shame and mortification the duke's lameness caused him perhaps to move very slowly he was still in the hall where the invaluable butler was carefully fitting him into his fur coat his closely cropped head emerged from the black astrachan collar looking very small and very fair and he held his hat in his hand and bowed politely to jean as she passed hurriedly by she scarcely saw him the burning red of her cheeks and the glistening of tears on her downcast black lashes caused him to divine that she had obtained scant comfort from her explanation with mrs weller he limped to the front door and looked after her in a hesitating undecided manner before asking for a hansom for jean instead of waiting decorously upon the steps of the mansion for the late miss marney's massive equipage to be drawn up before the front door flew past the astonished servants past the yet more astonished william who was standing on the pavement with the rug over his arm and ran to the spot where buckham and the fat horses were sleepily waiting half way down the square she ran she flew and she opened the door for herself she scrambled into the carriage and hid herself as quickly as she could within its friendly shelter poor william rug on arm saw nothing for it but to pocket his dignity and run after her as fast as he could but he was not young and he was little accustomed to running so that jean had a moment's breathing space in which to collect her scattered wits and gather up her failing powers before he arrived panting at the door of the brougham drive me home at once she said with a courage born of despair i am i am ill at least i am tired and i can't go any further to-day william touched his hat and mounted the box she took and run like a lamplighter and then she said she was ill he said in deep amazement to his fellow jean held her head high as she descended at her own front door and walked through the hall into the morning-room but directly the door was shut behind her she sank upon the couch and wept tears of humiliation i must never let louis know he would be ashamed of me oh how could i be such a fool the sister of an officer and a gentleman she might have been a little nicer and me in mourning if anybody in the kindness of their heart dropped in to see me would i treat them so her tears relieved her a little but alas the lady of the house even though she be a lonely lady cannot weep at will she cried with one eye so to speak on the door
lest hewitt should come in and make up the fire before she had done and presently crept to her room to remove all traces of her tears before dunham should arrive to put away her outdoor things dunham had sternly insisted that jean must now be waited upon as beseemed the head of a household so magnificent consequently the aged maid climbed the steep staircase for the purpose of hanging up in the wardrobe the little black hat and jacket which jean could just as easily have put away for herself and for taking out of it the plain black gown which was only one of two that had been purchased as mourning for miss marney but it pleased dunham to maintain this semblance of an occupation and jean was very willing to give her pleasure and indeed thankful for her company on any pretext that she might indulge herself in the luxury of conversation as she mounted the nursery staircase in haste to be beforehand with dunham upon this occasion she cast a glance of pitying recollection at the little white gate and thought of the young man who was paying a life penalty for one woman's carelessness he was very good and he had nice blue eyes with a kind funny expression she thought but oh i shall never be able to think of the little heir again in the same way he must always have been fair and gentle and not at all my idea of a man i thought of a sturdy beautiful laughing boy like louise used to be oh i wish i could tell somebody what i have done this day i know i shall lie awake all night thinking what a fool i have made of myself it would be a relief to even tell mrs dunham but she struggled bravely against the temptation oh dear oh dear but i must keep it secret if only for the sake of louise and because i am a de corset then she tried vainly to comfort herself after all it was only a mistake she looked up at the simpering disdainful face of the comtesse anne marie which now smiled upon her from the wall of her bedroom where she had ventured now that the house belonged to louise to suspend the triple frame of miniatures mrs weller would not have turned you away from her door she said proudly as soon as dunham appeared and after the fashion of womankind jean played round the edge of the secret she was determined not to betray who do you think i met to-day mrs dunham i am sure i can't say ma'am said dunham who having already heard from william of her young lady's extraordinary exit from one twenty nine grosvenor square was burning with curiosity as to the why and the wherefore of such behaviour the little boy who fell down the nursery staircase here he is not a cripple but slightly lame he is grown up now but he is still not very big and looks very delicate for a man the duke of monaghan well to be sure i dare say you mentioned ma'am that the old rooms was kept just as they was i had very little conversation with him said jean rather hastily i was very sorry for him though and she added to herself and he looked a little sorry for me sorry for him ma'am it's not dukes and such like as usually calls for sorrow said dunham rather shocked if you had seen him mrs dunham you would have been sorry for him too he is so delicate looking and so fair that he blushes like a girl of course he is only a boy and i dare say he may be very shy the accident happened over twenty years ago ma'am i can't quite think him so young as all that said dunham rather stiffly is it possible then he must be as old as louise when he left home how dreadful for beside him he would look as though a breath might blow him away i don't mean he isn't very nice looking in his way mrs dunham but if a man is not straight and strong and active i don't see what he's fit for said jean whose views of mankind were strictly limited to the horizon of louise well ma'am there's many things he's fit for and if you ask me said dunham with an increase of asperity a duke is a duke and you may depend on it his grace would find plenty of strong active men only too thankful to stand in his shoes even if one of them is filled with a lame foot his grace is that what he is called said jean it sounds very pretty but somehow more appropriate for a nobleman of the olden time in a court suit and a powdered wig than for just an ordinary young man with a black coat and a bunch of violets in his buttonhole dukes is not ordinary men ma'am said dunham reproachfully i was brought up to respect my betters do you think that his title makes him your better said jean thoughtfully 
yes ma'am i do said dunham who had the courage of her opinions i am no radical church and state is what i always says if his ancestors wasn't no better than mine it stands to reason they wouldn't have been made dukes there is something in that mrs dunham and i am glad you like titles so much for i have always thought them prettier than plain names myself but uncle roberts is a radical and he says he despises them most likely your uncle roberts has never come across them miss said dunham snorting i don't know that he has said jean rather crestfallen people as has them is glad enough to wear them ma'am knowing well enough it gives them a right to be respected more than common folk are folk who have titles so much more respected than other folks unless they are great really great i mean in other ways as well said jean rather doubtfully living with uncle roberts i have never realized that he always speaks of them as though he were rather sorry for them than otherwise and louise never said anything about it suddenly her face lit up with pleasure but now that louise is rich perhaps he will be able to buy back the chateau de corset and the land that belonged to his ancestors and claim his right to be called the marquis de corset you would like to hear him call that mrs dunham wouldn't you i can't say i should miss jane not but why said jean in surprise well ma'am since you ask me i have no opinion of foreign titles an honest english marquis is a very different thing to a foreign marquis why is it different asked jean in a mortified tone i can't say why but so it is ma'am people think nothing of it in fact if anything they think the worse of you i hope the captain will be satisfied to stop as he is for if he goes calling himself a marquis or anything of that kind it's my opinion said dunham firmly that as likely as not wherever the poor young gentleman goes he'll be taken for an adventurer or an impostor and get suspected of being no better than he should end of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Lonely Lady of Governor Square」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lonely Lady of Grosvenor Square by Mrs. Henry de Pasteur. Chapter Eight The Caller hewitt threw open the door of the morning-room and with swelling chest and sonorous tones of deepest gratification announced the duke of monaghan june came forward to greet her first visitor looking both shy and eager the duke as he shook hands said i hope i need not apologize for venturing to call unasked upon my cousin it did not occur to his inexperienced hostess that this introductory remark had been almost as carefully prepared as her opening speech to mrs wheeler indeed i am only surprised and delighted she said with honest joy i think it most kind and neighborly of you to come cousinly he said accepting with a smile the low chair she drew forward for him as solicitously as though he were really the helpless cripple she had imagined him to be do you know that nobody has been to see me once since i arrived she said wistfully except professional gentlemen with a sudden reminiscence of her aunt's reproof who do not count as visitors don't they count said the duke amused they do not she said firmly she felt that though the rector's wife might make mistakes old miss marney must know better than this youthful gentleman smile as he would june however felt inclined to smile too as she looked at him it was certainly refreshing to see somebody young and the duke looked very young indeed to june hardly more than a boy he was also pleasant to behold his clothes were so severely well cut his collar so glossy his boots so spotless his fair hair so closely cropped his buttonhole of violets so fresh louis had always been particular about his clothes 
june smiled approvingly at her visitor and he divined her approval and was secretly pleased not knowing that it arose entirely from her fondness for seeing everybody and everything clean and tidy do many professionals come to see you he asked with polite curiosity not very many mr valentine came this morning to explain to me all about the power of attorney you know that louis is sending him and other business matters with dignity this house and everything in it belongs to my brother louis but mr valentine is to manage it all till he comes home and i am taking care of the furniture and pictures he is a soldier you know and now he is in Somaliland. He must have arrived in Obabaya by this time. Just as he was coming home, he was ordered there from South Africa. He was all through the Boer War, and never was sick nor sorry once, nor wounded, though he was in so many battles. He was very lucky, said the Duke. June interpreted his expression as one of regret, and answered it with the outspoken sympathy of a child. It must have been dreadful for you to not be able to go. He colored, but replied as simply as she had spoken. Thank you. Yes, it was. But both my brothers went. It was rather rough luck on you, wasn't it? His going. I suppose he is your only brother. How did you guess that? She said surprised. His blue eyes twinkled more than ever. He was certainly a very pleasant-looking young man, though so unfortunate as to be neither tall nor strong. He is my only brother, and my twin, if you would like to hear about him. But of course, I don't know if you would be interested. Still, he is your cousin too, she said. The soft orange-brown eyes glowed beneath the black lashes, and the fresh red lips parted as she looked at him pathetically unconscious of her own eagerness, yet obviously trembling with the hope that here, at last, she had found one who would be interested in Louis. The Duke, too, was young and solitary and sympathetic. He drew his low chair a little closer to the book of beauty which lay upon the low table dividing them. Her freshness and sincerity charmed him now as they had charmed him at his first meeting with her, when he had realized instantly being in spite of his youth a man of the world that her unconventional behavior arose from no want of modesty but from inexperience her apparent boldness of action was as the boldness of the robin perching on the gardener's fairy spade so timid that he will fly at a sudden movement so confident that he trusts without proof or warrant the friendship of mankind before hewitt and william appeared with the tea things the duke knew almost as much about his cousin louis as june did herself he learnt of his successes at school at sandhurst and in the army he learnt that she had not seen him for five years that she thought of him still as the bright eager boy who had left her when he was scarce twenty years old and that her life and heart and soul were filled with his image and he wondered how much the real Louis resembled the Louis of her faithful dreams. Look, I have his new photographs, the first he has had done since he left England, and he is so changed, I can hardly believe it It is Louis. But oh, how glad I am to have them, said the little sister, and she fetched, with hands that actually trembled with pleasure and excitement, a shabby desk from a corner where it lay hid from Dunham's disapproving eyes. I brought it down from my own room, for it gives me something to do when I feel too dull, she said apologetically, to sort and arrange his letters and read them. Some of them are very interesting, at least to me, she added hurriedly, alarmed lest the Duke should ask to see them. Of course they are rather private, for I am the only person he has to confide in, in the whole world, and it is just the same with me. There is only Louis, really. Today I have the first letter he has written since he heard of Aunt Caroline's death, and of her leaving her great fortune to him. Doesn't it seem wonderful? For Louis always wished to be rich. Is he very glad? said the Duke. 
He is not so glad, but that I thought he would have been gladder, she said, unconsciously betraying her disappointment. But Louis is always original and never takes things as one would expect. He is more full of the expedition and shipping the horses than of anything else. But yes, he is very glad. He says, now all your dreams may come true. And that is a great deal for a boy who is apt to laugh at one's foolish dreams, you know. The Duke looked at the photograph of his new cousin and saw a tall young soldier in khaki with a face so much older than June's that it was difficult to believe him her twin brother. A stern, good-looking face with marked eyebrows meeting over the bridge of an alkaline nose and a thick mustache partially veiling the short upper lip. He is a fine fellow, said the Duke in an interested tone. I do not wonder you are proud of him. Anyone would be proud of him, for there is nothing he cannot do. He cannot bear to be beaten, she said, holding her head high. He does not look as though he would ever be beaten. I am sure he will get on. If they give him a chance, if they are not jealous of him, but I am always afraid they will be jealous. He is so young and so clever, said June, shaking her head over this mysterious reference to the powers that be. And Louis is not one to think of his own interests. He is only too disinterested, a little too scornful and quick to show people what they ought to do, or he used to be. But he had very persuasive ways, too. He was the only person who could ever manage Uncle Robert. And I dare say he has grown wiser still with all he has been through. Poor boy. A tear rolled unheeded down her cheek and splashed onto the little bundle of letters clasped in her lap as she told him how Louis in his poverty had yet managed to ensure his life for his sister's benefit and to pay his debts. To think he will never be anxious about money any more, she said, wiping her eyes. It was that I could not bear, that a boy like him should be anxious. It was foreign to his nature. He was so generous that he couldn't help spending. Poor boy. But it was his only fault. And now Aunt Caroline has saved him from those worries and troubles that made us wonder whether he would ever be able to stick to the army. After all, he had gone through to get there. She now told him about Uncle Roberts and the why and wherefore of her arrival in Grosvenor Square and how much disappointed she was in London life. But he thought her so pretty and so earnest as she said it that he did not even smile. Young people are usually fond of talking about themselves when they find an attentive and sympathetic auditor, and perhaps the Duke was no exception to the rule, but he had the advantage of June in good breeding, and thus found himself constrained to be, upon this occasion, only a listener. His courteous attention never wavered for an instant, though it is possible he might not have been so exemplary in his politeness had her personality appealed to him less strongly. As it was, he enjoyed the opportunity her conversation afforded him to observe her at his leisure. As he rested comfortably in poor Miss Caroline's easiest chair, sheltered by a glass screen from the roaring fire which Hewitt had built up with a zeal proportionate to the visitor's rank. She was dressed in the plainest of black morning gowns, with snowy collar and wristbands, but her hands and throat were white and soft enough to bear the contrast. He thought he had never seen coloring so pure with eyes and hair so dark, nor half so pretty an effect as the pointed shadows cast by those downcast black lashes upon the clear red of her cheeks. Her beauty was beauty of the round, childish, dimpled order, but she looked so healthy, so innocent, and so modest that her little rusticities were all 
a picture as the young man told himself in the jargon of the day it was only the setting that was all wrong this garish room with its meaningless mixture of modern fashion and relics real or imitation of a bygone day this wistful creation of an old woman trying to identify herself with the present which she neither understood nor cared for instead of clinging to the past which was one with her and to which she belonged typical of aunt caroline was the juxtaposition of her antiquated harp and a brand new Bechstein grand piano as was the melange of moore's irish melodies and bellini's operas with the latest burlesque of the day in her music holder june knew not a note of music her studies had not included pianoforte playing partly on account of cecilia's jealousies and partly because of the rector's wife had pointed out that since there was no piano and partly because the rector's wife had pointed out that since there was no piano at calle de Sel, it would be waste of time for her to learn she had been very glad to be spared the trouble for cecilia's scales and exercises did not sound very tempting and the less so because june had an ear for harmony miss caroline's new piano was therefore wasted upon her niece but the duke was a musician and had consequently noted it directly he entered the apartment which as he observed made such an inappropriate background for june's rustic prettiness so she was a farmer's niece that of course accounted for it all he saw her as in a picture at home upon the mountains her dark hair blowing in the wind her red cheeks and dark eyes bright in the sunshine of her native wales her pretty hands busied among the flowers of the garden bounded by tall hedges of clipped yew or working in the cool dark dairy among the red earthen pans of frothing milk in such places would this simple maid be at home but never never in a modern drawing-room starting from a reverie he found his hostess inviting him but with a pretty solicitude and hesitation to visit the old nurseries if he chose nothing has changed said little june there is the white gate at the top of the steep staircase which your father i suppose had put up i don't remember that he said shaking his head of course not it was put up after your dreadful accident she said with pitying eyes and lowered voice but that is the only change there are the barred windows and the nursery rhyme paper only it is rather faded and dirty i am afraid ah i recollect that he said quite eagerly as i walked up pippin hill was my favourite because the pretty maid was so very pretty and the hills so remarkably steep and the other was curly lax sitting on a cushion to sew a fine seam yes yes said june delighted but there are several others tom the piper's son and simple simon so there were i can see it all perfectly you have a very good memory then for you must have been quite a baby since it was over twenty years ago i was nearly six years old nearly six and it was over twenty years ago then you must be as old as i am she said astonished Louis and i were twenty-five in october and i was twenty-five last april he said smiling i am even a little older than you are and i have been thinking of you as quite a boy about eighteen or nineteen she said ingenuously he would have minded more had he had been five years younger and above all had she not blushed as she said it as it was he rather enjoyed her discomfiture i am afraid i must put off visiting the scene of my disaster he said smiling as he rose from the low chair before the fire i have just passed upon your good nature rather a long time already but perhaps i venture to hope you will let me come again one day he stood beside her and held the hand she gave him for a moment longer than is quite usual in shaking hands but june was too fluttered to observe it must you go she said with sincere regret oh yes please come again
and let it be as soon as soon as you can for i should like to ask you so many things which it would be easier to ask you than mr valentine since you are my cousin and young though not so young as i fancied <laughs> she laughed shyly it is much easier to talk to people of one's own age said the duke that is just it but it is one of my chief faults that i talk too much when once i set off and don't let the other person talk at all and then they go away and i recollect they have said nothing only listen to me this was so much the true state of the case in the present instant that duke could not help laughing outright <laughs> it will be my turn to talk when i come again he said consolingly that reminds me of louis when he used to come home from school we took it in turns by the clock to speak five minutes each there was so much to say said joan seriously i had no idea i should have had so much to say to you however but all these weeks and weeks i have been so silent that i suppose it all had to come out with a rush yet i did want to ask you anything you will was it a very wrong thing i did the other day going to call on mrs weller not in the least wrong in the country it would have been quite right i saw at once why you had mistaken it was just that you were not used to london then what is the rule here here you may live in a house for twenty years and scarcely know your next neighbor by sight then how do you ever make new friends people are introduced to you and you ask them to call <laughs> he said laughing and reddening just as you might have asked me only you didn't but i would in a moment if i had known it was the right thing to do joan assured him earnestly i hoped that was so and that is why being your cousin i ventured to come he said and his blue eyes twinkled merrily is there anything else you wish to ask me only this I'm afraid you will think me ignorant, but if I am ignorant, it is better to tell the truth. I do not quite know, for instance, what I ought to call you, nor even know how I should address a letter to you. Not that I was thinking of writing, <laughs> she added hurriedly. The Duke appeared not to notice her confusion. I should like you, if you would as i am undoubtedly related to you through the marnies of orsett to call me cousin dennis as my other cousins do he said instantly and i am afraid you will think me very ignorant for i was obliged to ask for miss marnie's niece <laughs> and as i am very bad at knowing how to spell people's names even when i do know them if you will be kind enough to write down yours for me i will write down mine for you Joan moved with electricity to the writing table and set forth materials for this purpose. I should like to call you Cousin Dennis very much, and I hope you will call me Cousin June, she said, brightening up. Duke sounds so unnatural somehow to me, and I can't tell you how glad I am to find some relations. I have always longed to be like other people and have cousins and uncles and aunts uncle roberts is a bachelor you see and the last of his family and aunt caroline was a spinster and the last of the marnies of orsett orsett hall was burnt down i remember said the duke i have always heard it was one of the finest places in the west of england noted for its picture gallery most of the pictures were saved you know said june they're upstairs i should like to see them some day he said with great animation I will ask Mrs. Pike to uncover them. They are all covered up. Covered up? But why? Mrs. Pike is afraid of the gold frames being fly-blown, 
and Aunt Caroline was afraid the London smoke would hurt them, explained June. You see, she could not get used to the London smoke after living for sixty years in the country. In such a beautiful country. Do you know it? My mother has a house on the other side of the country, near Exmoor. We used to be there a great deal. I hoped you lived in London. I live in Ireland, he said, smiling. But we are a good deal in London, too. My mother likes it. I have looked forward to London, but now I'm quite sure I like the country far, far better, she said mournfully. Still, she brightened up. It is nicer now that I know I have relations here. It is very pleasant to have relations. I hope you find me a pleasant relation, he said. He made her another grave little bow, and the manner Jean had observed before to be so old-fashioned and yet so pleasing in a person of his years. As he opened the door, she sprang forward, blushing even more than ever. Cousin Dennis, would you, would you like one of his photographs? said Joan. He has sent me six. I, I could spare you a copy if you'd like. I should like it of all things, said the Duke, and he received it gratefully. I wonder if that was right or too, too familiar, thought Joan. As the door closed upon him, and she ran to the bell and rang it, as she had observed Mrs. Weller did, for her departing guests. Oh, I hope I have not babbled, as Louis used to call it too much. But he was so kind, and I am sure he was interested. So now the duchesses will see Louis's picture, for he will certainly show it to her. I hope she will be as much struck with it as poor Aunt Caroline was with the one in my locket. Or more, since Louis is handsomer than ever. But how he has changed. He has not his laughing face. The war has aged him. Or perhaps seeing so many of his comrades die. Oh, Louis, Louis, if you would but come safely home. The serious eyes of the photograph seemed to return her gaze and to suggest the thoughts of unspeakable sad and lofty lay behind that grave young brow. Decidedly, Louis had grown older. She turned with relief to the familiar boyish face in the locket, now restored to its resting place next to her heart. When he talks and laughs with me, his dear face will come back to me as it used to be, she said, and the tears filled her brown eyes. Oh, Louis! I have waited so long that I sometimes feel the day will never come. As Joan changed her day gown for the plain black muslin which Dunham had placed ready for her and insisted she would wear every evening for her solitary dinner, she received instead of the delegated congratulations she expected a solemn warning from her self-appointed maid and guardian. Yes, ma'am. I don't deny it was attentive of the young gentleman to call, though to my thinking it's a pity he should have waited till my poor lady was dead, what was nearer to him than ever you was, Miss Jane. But like seeks like, and Hewitt tells me his grace is young looking for his age, as you are yourself, Miss Jane, eighteen or twenty. I would give you not a day more. Oh, Miss Dunham, I hope I look older than he does. Maybe so, maybe not. There's his age in Debrett for all to see, and Hewitt and me looked it out this very day. But it's a very distant cousinship, if at all, as Mrs. Pike has been telling. I would have liked it better, ma'am. If the Duchess, his mamma, had come along with him, I don't hold much, ma'am, with single young gentlemen calling on single young ladies without their mammas coming with them. Oh, Mrs. Dunham, 
What could be the harm? She felt inclined to cry. Was she to shut the front door in the face of her only visitor to please Dunham? Had she made another mistake? People living in Governor Square were governed by rules that would never occur to the inhabitants of Kea de Sel. If one was lucky enough to possess a cousin, he would be made welcome as a matter of course. She thought of the Duke, his politeness, his gentleness, above all his lameness. How could she appear ungrateful for the kindness he had shown? She blushed as she recalled her warm and pressing invitation to him to call again as soon as might be. Joan began to feel Dunham's surveillance as a tiresome thing. But she had lived under authority all her life, and had not the courage to defy the old woman. The brightness died out of her eyes and cheeks, and the dull, weary expression returned. Her lips quivered. She yearned so terribly for companionship. Is there anything more I can do for you, ma'am? Nothing more. Thank you, said Joan with sinking heart. Dunham had done enough for one evening, was her dismal reflection. Spoiled the recollection of the first happy afternoon she had spent since her arrival, and all her anticipations of future visits from her kind cousin Dennis. Are you quite sure, Miss Dunham? she faltered that i ought not to have visits from single gentlemen who are relations however nice and polite and well known they may be not without their mamas has called ma'am i'm very sure of that if you wasn't alone it would be another matter if i wasn't alone i shouldn't want him says june almost petulantly after all, I was introduced to his mamma, Mrs. Dunham, and she asked me to go and see her. Then I should go, ma'am. Would that make it all right for cousin, for the Duke to come and see me, do you think? It's not for me to advise my betters, ma'am. I hope I know my place too well. A hint is a very different thing. To giving advice said dunham closing her thin lips in a manner which as june knew by this time meant that either she had nothing else to say or that having more in her mind than prudence permitted her to reveal she intended to keep it all to herself mrs dunham is a very unsatisfactory companion sighed june as she went down the echoing stone staircase of the mournful empty house and walked into the silent morning room to await Hewitt's solemn announcement of dinner. She was seized with a sudden despair. I won't. I can't bear it any longer, cried June. I am too wretched and solitary. I shall go mad here all alone, waiting and waiting for Louis, and nobody allowed to come near me. It is all very fine to say I am taking care of his furniture and his house, but what do they leave for me to do? She looked wildly round for inspiration, and her eyes fell on her shabby desk, standing among the costly trifles on the occasional table, and looking sadly out of place there. Yet how solid and handsome she had thought the old leather case when it stood on the painted window ledge of her attic at home. At home. The word brought the inspiration which Jill was unconsciously seeking. It pointed out the way of escape, even for a moment, from the intolerable they knew of her life in Governor Square. She took an instant resolve. Tomorrow morning, what it could be tonight, she would go home to Kied Yisel and entreat her uncle roberts either to come back with her or to let her stay at home till louis return at least uncle roberts would not tell her that it was not his place to advise her and though his experience of what should or could not be done by young ladies living in governor square must be very limited he was neither as old in june's eyes and quite as sensible as dunham he had sometimes talked of his intention to go and see the sights of london before he died surely she could put it to him delicately that now was the very time 
since he could not expect to live forever. June would have been very glad enough to see the sights of London herself had she been quite certain what and where they were. But she had not liked to inquire, lest she should be suspected of hankering after amusements instead of mourning her aunt, her kind aunt, who had given all she had in the world to Louis. Secretly, June felt quite sure that Miss Caroline would rather have sympathized than otherwise with her wish for companionship and her longing to let a little brightness in upon the dullness of her life but she was not by any means so sure of dunham and it was dunham who now practically governed the house and had almost assumed miss marnie's place therein mrs pike was too old and hewitt too stupid to contend against her rule the old servants clung faithfully to their duties and watched the jealous eye for the least symptom of desire on the part of the little upstart stranger to rebel in the slightest degree against the traditions of the house june was uneasily conscious of their watchfulness and it increased her timidity and discomfort in her solitary state she respected dunham and pike and even the serious upper housemaid who never it seemed to her spoke at all even hewitt and William, and the stout coachman held some share in her regard. They were all so respectable, so steady, and so faithful to their duties. But she could not help for all that, secretly looking forward to the time when Louis should descend like a bombshell upon this dull and solemn household, and scatter the old traditions, and the silence, and the solemnity to the winds. Louis, with his merry laugh, and in imperious will and cheerful disregard of difficulties far from never allowing young gentlemen to come near the house without their mammas thought june indignantly for the phrase wrangled she was assured he would on the contrary fill it with his friends from morning till night and louis had many friends for he was constantly referring with enthusiasm to one or the other of them a revelation was certainly in store for the old servants she took out his last letter of course the cable couldn't go into detail louis had written but it looks as though our hard times are over forevermore my genie dear if old valentine and thingabob are my solicitors now sounds very magnificent they will see you have everything you want in this world till i can arrange to go shares with you as of course i shall when i come home i'm writing them all sorts of directions by this mail that was so like Louis, always perfectly reading and willing to give orders, where June would have hesitated and scrubbled for weeks. Oh, my Junie, if you knew what an immense load this had lifted off my chest. God bless poor Aunt Caroline. I shall be able to write more when I get your letters and valentines. I hear from my boss here that he knows the firm. And it's a first-rate West End firm, so I can trust the old boy straight away which is a comfort. Thank God it came just before I started, which enables me to do all necessary business before I leave, besides sending me off with a light heart. My chief advises me to send old Valentine a power of attorney, which he thinks will facilitate matters for you greatly. I have been so occupied that I've had no moment to sit down and write a coherent letter. And now that I try, I can't concentrate my thoughts. And when I'm board the ship this morning, and after three years, blissful forgetness of ships, the same old feeling of nausea came over me that it always assails one as one gets the whiff of engine room, kitchens, etc., and all the vile things that make life on board intolerable to many landsmen. I am so anxious for your first letter, right on receipt of my telegraph about Salomaland. I hope you won't be too disappointed, my darling Jeanie but quite cheerful when you think it is to be but a short trip. No more three-year wars, I hope. If you can find any, send me some maps of the country I'm going to, but nothing else, however rich we may be. God bless you, my gentle Jeanette. Think what times we shall have when we meet. I have no end of surprises in store for you, and how we will make the money fly. I am forgetting this is a sad time for you you may be crying your dear eyes out for poor aunt caroline but for my sake cheer up be as happy as ever you can i hope i shall find letters from you waiting 
said Obia. Louis bade her cheer up, and if he were here he would understand in a moment how utterly impossible was cheerfulness under the circumstances for his doleful and isolated little sister. With beating heart she rang the bell and desired William to say that the carriage would be wanted first thing in the morning to take her to Paddington. He will tell Hewitt, and Hewitt will tell Mrs. Dunham, and she will tell Mrs. Pike, and so the ice will be broken, she thought triumphantly. That will make it easier for me to just say casually to Mrs. Dunham at bedtime that I have made up my mind rather suddenly to go home and see Uncle Roberts for a couple of nights or so. I am very glad I have settled it. Now there can be no drawing back. And the lonely lady, outwardly composed, but inwardly quaking, presently sat down to her solitary meal. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of The Lonely Lady of Crossvenor Square. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ruhi Huck. The Lonely Lady of Grosvenor Square by Mrs. Henry de la Pasture. Chapter 9 The Mountain Farm. Cordethel stood in the middle of an orchard, a plain stone-tiled farmhouse with no pretence to an approach, save a track over the grass from the yew-shadowed gate to the door. A low, uneven wall, built without mortar, of great boulders and slabs of stone, coated with moss and sprouting with hardy ferns and pennywort, enclosed the orchard. And though the old garden of the Duke's imagination was non-existent, there was a large plot of ground, fenced in from the chickens, at the back of the homestead, which was devoted mainly to growing potatoes, cabbages and onions, but was also well stocked with the roots of old-fashioned herbs and cottagers' flowers. It had not occurred to Jean to telegraph and warn her uncle of her intended visit. A telegram, as she very well knew, would have startled him much more than her sudden appearance, besides entailing a payment of porterage which would have annoyed him considerably. Since Dunham had refused to permit her to make a brown paper parcel of necessaries to carry under her arm, which would have been much more convenient, and had instead insisted upon encumbering her with her late aunt's travelling bag, Jean had been obliged to leave her belongings at the station to be called for later by John Evans, her uncle's man. She carried in her hand only her shabby desk, containing the family treasures, from which, true to her brother's injunctions, she would not be parted. The daylight was beginning to fail as she walked rapidly along the main road, and turned into the narrow lane, which led upwards to the open path over the hills to Coedithel. A joyous sense of freedom regained caused her heart to lighten and her face to glow as with the ease of youth and strength and long habit she climbed the steep and stony track over the mountain pausing now and then to cast a glance of recognition at the familiar landscape breathless but beaming she presently pushed open the orchard gate sped across the grass lifted the latch of the farmhouse door and stepped into the kitchen a pleasant sense of homecoming never before experienced brought the tears to her glad brown eyes she had not known that the familiar place of her childhood was dear to her before she went to london often and often had she and louise grumbled over its smallness its homeliness and its distance from trefgock once the centre of life to both now its very remoteness from the dwelling houses of other men seemed to make it more truly a place of rest she closed the door and came softly round the old solid oaken screen built into the wall that sheltered her uncle's patchwork covered armchair from draught one half of the well-scrubbed white deal table was laid for tea 
a big loaf a black handled knife a square lump of fresh yellow butter a red earthen pitcher of milk and a pot of jam the black teapot stood warming on the hob and the kettle was boiling well-known sounds in the back kitchen told her that uncle roberts had come in and was cleaning himself at the pump not wishing to startle him too much she rapped on the wooden screen with her knuckles and stood there smiling and dimpling uncle roberts came forth immediately clumping heavily across the tiled floor of the back kitchen in his heavy boots wiping his hands with a cloth and peering under his bushy brows to see who it was i have come to pay you a visit uncle said jean Llewellyn roberts was not a demonstrative man he endured the kiss his niece bestowed upon his hairy cheek with equanimity and said well to be sure in surprise it did not occur to him to express any pleasure at her advent but jean knew him well enough to be quite sure he was glad to see her you got my letter uncle didn't you about louise going to somaliland i got it right enough said uncle roberts he went to the bottom of the deal staircase and called loudly sally morgan there's jenny come home and then with a nod retired to the back kitchen to complete his ablutions granny morgan was less impassive than the farmer she was a rosy little old woman with a white cap tied under her chin and a short woolen skirt cut well above her blue stockings and neat clogs though like the farmer she loved louise the best she was yet very fond of jean well to be sure my dearie this is a surprise so here you be come home just in time for your tea she kissed jean heartily have you brought any news dearie louise was just starting for somaliland when he last wrote granny and he says it won't be long before he comes home oh my what a day it will be the lads down to penny one be going to carry him shoulder high the day he comes they talk of fireworks and all sorts and he'll be grander than ever with all this money it won't change him granny no it won't my dearie for the lad's not the sort to change well if i didn't always say he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth it's to be hoped they won't be keeping him out there much longer then she raised her voice and cried to the back kitchen roberts your tea's waiting she poured the boiling water into the teapot and set it on the table you'll be wanting something after your journey dearie don't he stop for nobody but just set to but jeanie knew better than to incur her uncle's displeasure by beginning before he had said grace uncle robert stood in his place and asked a blessing with his eyes shut and granny morgan put the bread platter at his elbow jean had not enjoyed a meal so much for weeks how delicious to her the home-made crusty bread the yellow butter slightly salted she abjured the tea and drank her accustomed measure of new milk from her own blue china mug inscribed in gilt letters a present from monmouth uncle roberts was evidently cudgelling his brains for the reason of his niece's sudden appearance but being chary of words preferred thinking to asking questions presently he brought forth the result of his cogitations be there anything wrong with this fine fortune his aunt left to louise no no uncle mr valentine the lawyer says it is as safe as the bank of england don't you get putting your trust in lawyers said uncle roberts gloomily they have been i mean the firm lawyers to the money of orset for three generations said jean that sounds respectable farmer said granny morgan who was of an optimistic disposition uncle llewellyn allowed it to be in mr valentine's favour who's taking care of this fine house now you've come away he asked rather anxiously the servants said jean you've been and left louise's house to servants why it is chock full of valuable things bain't it said uncle roberts they ought to be took care of but there are fifteen servants to take care of them uncle farmer you bain't reasonable said mrs morgan them upper servants aren't like the girls we keep wasn't it on the letter you sent my dearie that the housekeeper or such had been with the old lady forty or fifty years they've all been with her for years and years oh uncle if you could see how respectable and to be trusted they are said jean almost appalled by such doubts besides with a perception 
that no words of hers could convey the full measure of pike's and dunham's respectability to her uncle if it comes to that uncle the lawyer's clerks or the government or somebody have taken lists of everything in the house down to the very spoons that will be for probate said uncle Levelin. these ere death does will come pretty heavy on louise i'm thinking but you've always held the rich should be taxed haven't you uncle said jean timidly in the abstract yes said uncle roberts pulling his red beard tax the rich i says in the abstract uncle Levelin did not like argument which being interpreted meant that he liked to state his own opinion but did not wish to hear the opinion of any one else so his womenkind were respectfully silent and he recovered his spirits but i dare say there'll be plenty left mr valentine says louise will be very rich hm said mr roberts and it was plain that he was not altogether delighted at the prospect what fair beats my understanding is why the old woman didn't leave her money to you he said thumping the table the lad being started and doing well for herself and having me to look to besides and you being with her it makes me feel fair evil to think of it did she take anything amiss with you no indeed uncle we were the best of friends mr valentine said it was because she liked me so much that she decided to alter her will and leave her money to louise instead of to charities twas a rum way of showing her liking for you oh uncle roberts you know it comes to just the same thing louise and me i would rather louise had it you was all for giving up everything to him deary all your life but you see if he doesn't make it up to you when he comes home wednesday's children is all for loving and giving and you was both born of a wednesday uncle roberts grunted and pushed back his chair when tea was over and as jean assisted her to wash up the tea things mrs morgan explained the cause of the farmer's depression he has been worriting himself like ever since the news came and no wonder there he was thinking that the lad would come after him here and all his affairs settled so he wouldn't have nothing to fret over on his deathbed when his time do has come it must and quite pleased to think your aunt should have you up to town to make a lady of you and provide for you and now he's all unsettled i know his mind misgives him but the boy will be took up with his fine fortune and look down on the farm like and yet he can't a bear to be at the trouble and expense of going over to tref gok and letting lawyer williams after his will sally morgan he says to me i thought that was over and done with he've not been the same man since thinking maybe it is you as ought to have the farm now in justice oh don't let him alter anything but i'll tell louise to write to him for he will never listen to you or me said jean but if the rector would advise him to put off making any changes till louise comes home that would be the best dear heart the rector and his wife have been away this many weeks most ever since you left away tis that sissy at the bottom of it all they say her wouldn't answer her mother's letters so poor mrs davies at last her took to her bed with grief and spite to think her own daughter should treat her so and she couldn't keep it to herself for molly jones at the post office has spread it abroad as mrs davies wrote five letters and a postcard running and never a one come back from mrs watson for her but why won't she write they say she's too stuck up but perhaps it is just that she's took up with her long family and got sick of wasting so much money on stamps for they say she's a long ways off in south america travelling with her old gentleman mrs davies was always terrible over fond of sissy and now the girl's paying her out for it tis always the way but she was that bad poor thing as the doctor advised her should go to foreign parts ah well i miss her for she gave me many a box of patent medicine one way and another and my inside being not what it was needs a lot of physique but jean grew impatient of the symptoms mrs morgan now proceeded to describe in detail and brought the conversation back to her uncle yes he be terrible interested with all the lad sends though he bain't fond of writing letters nor yet of reading them as a rule but he boasts away when he thinks i aren't listening to john jones and davy griffiths whenever they comes here 
men's all alike my deary they'd be ashamed of loving their own flesh and blood till they be away from them and then out it comes willy-nilly she nodded and winked at jean when uncle llewellyn grumbled at having to send john evans all the way to the station for jean's bag nice fine lady ways you've got into jenny he said shaking his head at her there's louise's photographs in the bag they were too big to fit into my desk he was photoed before leaving south africa she breathed what was that for for me and for you uncle he's changed ever so as one would expect in so many years she said with a pretty timid smile uncle roberts made no answer but she heard him presently shouting to john evans to make haste and not be all night fetching the things up from the station jean finding herself alone in her little attic beneath the roof hung the miniatures again on the brass hooks louise had placed for them long ago over the tiny fireplace she was for the first time struck by the incongruity of their surroundings what had her silk-clad jewel-decked powdered be-ribboned ancestors to do with this whitewashed room and flock paper how very very small and poor it all looked how hard the narrow bed and rough the cotton sheets how small and lumpy the pillow stuffed with poultry feathers by old granny morgan's wrinkled hard-working hands jean blushed with shame at herself for noticing such things and for the reflection that crossed her mind that dear old granny was much less refined in speech and appearance than dunham and would probably courtesy to mrs pyke in her black silk gown and chantilly lace cap was it possible that the old woman's endless stories of her ailments had become fatiguing instead of interesting to bear or that she could draw comparisons between the manner of serving meals in grosvenor square and in the farmhouse kitchen to the disadvantage of the latter the pricking of her conscience reminded her of many a reproof she had bestowed upon louis in the past for grumbling when he returned from school or college at some of the primitive domestic arrangements at the hillside farm and it reminded her also of the sweet-tempered meekness with which he had received her ignorant assurances of their perfection how little she had known of the world then she thought she knew a great deal now and kneeling very humbly at the narrow bedstead prayed god not to allow her experiences of grandeur or luxury to make her proud or disdainful of the lowly roof which had sheltered her childhood to that prayer she added her passionate entreaties for her brother's safe and speedy return how often she had knelt beside that bed sobbing and praying through the dark days of the south african war and here was louise going blithely forth to fresh danger she thought of his words god has been very good to me why should this luck come to me when every fellow out here would give anything to go why indeed thought jean ruefully as she blew out the candle and laid her brown head on the small hard pillow she shivered a little for though the weather was surprisingly mild for the end of january yet the fireless attic was a great deal colder in this fresh atmosphere than her luxurious bedroom in grosvenor square the forlorn sense of being again alien to her surroundings returned upon her in the darkness she was fond of uncle roberts but she had nothing in common with him and had talked more to aunt caroline in a few hours than to her uncle in her whole lifetime why indeed had she not talked less and listened more she thought remorsefully cousin denise was even more companionable than aunt caroline partly because he inspired her in spite of his dukedom with less awe partly because he was of her own generation was it because the descendant of the de Corsets had more natural affinity with these fine people than with the sturdy honest farmer to whom she had been all her life indebted for her daily bread jean hoped earnestly that her feelings held nothing of ingratitude with all her might she respected uncle roberts respected him in spite of his oddity his silence his fiery bristling unkempt hair and beard his lengthy exposition of the scriptures his contempt for everything he did not understand and all these things had been sore trials in their time to louise and herself she respected his independence his piety his industry his solid stolid kindness of heart his stern uprightness yet now that she had seen him again she wondered how she had thought it possible to ask his advice 
when had she or louise asked counsel of uncle roberts it had never occurred to either of them in their confident youth and with their consciousness of a superior education but that they must know better than he still i will ask him for there is nobody else jean finally decided after an hour's wakefulness and anxious pondering over the situation but her mind was filled with misgivings as she fell asleep in the early morning waking to sunshine she forgot all her troubles and went out rejoicing she climbed the rocky grass slopes above coedithel among the dead bracken to the source of the mountain torrent that supplied the farm with water finding its way thence to the great river which ran through the valley below there had been heavy rains and the stream was doubled in volume rushing loudly over the moss-grown rocks which impeded its course and forming and seething round every obstacle though the sky was of a brilliant blue the sun newly risen over the opposite mountain was hidden by a wandering army of purple clouds which passing over the valley cast its deep shadow on the brown hillsides the song of the birds deceived by the unseasonable mildness into the belief that spring was closer at hand resounded far and near just below her glistened the stab tiled roof of the farm and its outhouses also built and roofed with grey stone and held together by hundred-year-old stems of giant ivy which like a thousand hairy snakes coiled about them holding aloft a heavy weight of luxuriant polished foliage above the reach of the farmer's shears she looked down upon the farm which appeared very small and solitary standing in the bare orchard and a long way farther down yet in the valley below the distant sawmill's steady hum came clearly to her ear through the still air not a breath stirred and from the little white homes dotted over the opposite mountain side the thin blue smoke shot steadily upwards against the leafless trees what sound more cheerful than the rushing of the mountain stream through this country of ivy grown moss-covered stone walls and crumbling ruins of wild bracken royal fern and red soil of emerald mistletoe crowning gnarled and lichened apple trees of solemn giant firs and sombre twisted aged yews as jean climbed the mountain path and turned to look yet again upon the wide stretch of cultivated country below the sun flooded the valley and the purple shadows of the cloud fleeted across the hills and vanished leaving brown wood green field and wet glistening roads alike gilded with the brightness of the morning glory it caught the brown river bubbling over the wires and turned the sparkling ripples to flashing diamonds it caught the red-brown ploughland the red-brown brushwood and the red-brown fern dying on the hills and their ruddiness grew transparent as fire it caught the smoke from the mock stick factory in the village and turned it into wreaths of floating silver jean thought of the london fog and stretched her arms above her head and laughed aloud for gladness that she ran down the hill again and entered the bare orchard where sheets and sheets of snowdrops with their white and green bells were drooping in the sunshine the only flower visible save a solitary aconite or so in the garden and the burden of yellow scentless winter jasmine nailed against the wall had he gone clean daft jenny said uncle roberts regarding her with amaze as she dropped on her knees in the wet grass to gather the snowdrops one would think he'd never seen the place before i have never missed it before jean said oh uncle roberts i want to ask your advice if you could spare a moment to talk to me she was surprised at her own boldness do you think i've time to stand talking this hour of the day said uncle roberts and he refused to take his eyes off john evans who was unloading the split trunks of dead apple trees from the cart and carrying them into the woodshed after supper that evening the farmer proved more amenable jean fetched him his pipe and filled it for him and gave granny morgan a look which was a preconcerted signal between them and the old woman slipped upstairs nothing loath to her well-earned slumbers jean brought her wooden stool and sat at her uncle's knee as though she were a little girl again but now she felt much older and wiser and more experienced than he even though she was about to ask his advice he glanced down upon her little bent brown head and the glance was not untender in fact it was as near a caress as a glance could be 
but jean did not see it and it did not trouble uncle roberts in the least that she should not know how kindly he thought of her probably he thought it would have been bad for her to learn the extent of his fatherly affection for her and her brother then he smoked in peace and had jean not made haste to break the silence he would have fallen asleep as he usually did after supper taking a nap in his armchair as a kind of preliminary canter before going to bed uncle roberts you used to say you meant to go to london some day to see all the sights ay said uncle roberts very placidly so i do couldn't you come now what couldn't you come now at once it seems to me it would be a very good time to come since aunt caroline's death hinted jean delicately life seems to me to have grown so very uncertain uncle roberts with some uneasiness assured her that he felt as well as ever he did in his life and she hastened to apologize i was not exactly thinking of that but there i am uncle roberts all alone in that big house i thought you said there was fifteen servants i mean not counting the servants jenny said uncle roberts never let me hear you say you don't count servants ain't they flesh and blood the same as you be this is what comes of riches flesh and blood is nothing fellow creatures is nothing oh uncle indeed you misunderstand they are very far from being nothing it is i who am nobody in the house and if anything frightened to death of them all do you mean they put upon you said uncle roberts preparing to get angry with his fellow creatures no no they mean very kindly but you see even if i wanted to be friendly with them they would keep themselves to themselves they pride themselves on knowing their places and try as you will so far would they go and no farther quite right too said uncle roberts approvingly platitudes always appealed to him especially if they sounded at all scriptural whatever their sense if you came up said jean you would sit in the parlour with me she was obliged to use a word within the scope of uncle roberts imagination the drawing-room might have aroused his contempt and the morning-room would have suggested a separate apartment for each portion of the day and excited his ridicule what should i do there said uncle roberts why said jean and stopped short after all what would uncle roberts do in the morning-room where she found next to nothing to do herself in spite of her education her love of dreaming and her letters to and from louise uncle roberts in his old coat and carpet slippers looked very comfortable and good-natured as he leant back in the patchwork covered armchair and smoked his cherry wood pipe there is a large comfortable room with big leather armchairs behind the dining-room she said unconsciously thinking aloud the walls are lined with bookcases you could smoke there for it is called the smoking-room and we needn't be indoors all the time for we could go and see the sights i think i see myself said uncle roberts taking his pipe out of his mouth after a long pause going to see the sights in february and the lambing coming on i forgot the lambing said jean a dismayed silence ensued when i talked of going to london but i done for sixty year without going anigh the place said uncle roberts unusually loquacious i was thinking of taking you both boy and girl along with me i guess i'll wait now till louise comes home but what am i to do said jean your duty said uncle roberts he smoked for quite five minutes without a word to let this recommendation sink into jean's understanding you wrote me a while back when your aunt was took poor soul ready or unready i beat sorry to say which nor it ain't for any one to say you wrote to me as you'd settled with her man of business that was your duty to stop and take care of louise's house and furniture for him yes i did said jean and i sent you a postcard not being so ready with my pen nor so free with my stamps as some said uncle roberts pointedly and i said dear jenny so be it or words to that effect yes said jean and she stifled an hysterical laugh if twas your duty to stop then tis your duty to stop now said uncle roberts decidedly but if people call on me well what harm can they do a cousin of miss marney's is called upon me faltered jean and dunham my aunt's maid thinks he ought not to come because i'm alone he has only been once but he he might come again ain't he respectable jean hesitated imperceptibly 
she felt that if she mentioned that miss marney's cousin was a duke her uncle roberts might once and for all declare that his respectability was very improbable with burning cheeks and downcast eyes she suppressed the dukedom he is most respectable she said firmly a very quiet young man and and lame does she think i haven't brought you up to know how to take care of yourself he said with rising wrath the best educated best behaved girl in the parish and you can't be trusted to have a young man call on you with fifteen respectable old family servants in the house at your back i dare say it's just because she's an old maid and has old-fashioned ideas said jean soothingly so have i old-fashioned ideas but i never heard that a respectable young man couldn't call on a respectable young woman nor i don't hold with such notions at all this is what comes of living in rich men's houses imputing evil when none exists if you didn't think it wrong uncle roberts and as he's a cousin of aunt caroline's i would like to see him now and then that is if he ever does come again for i find london very lonely it is a very dull place uncle roberts considered a quiet lame young man did not sound very dangerous and jean was a steady sensible girl also he was indignant that miss marney's servants should venture to criticise his niece i can't see no harm in your seeing him now and again dunham or no dunham he said obstinately End of chapter 9